purpose has been uh, widely neglected category. We, we too often ask the question, how? And rarely the question, why? Why do we want to save the world? Why do we want to see all that change? And where do we want to go from here? Yes, we can come to a conclusion that it is difficult, that it is against odds, that it is that our political and, and, and economic systems are, they are resilient. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean we cannot change them. Well, we, we create them, we can change them. So let's do it and do that in a meaningful way, not just for the sake of change. Um, in the 21st century, we are facing challenges which cannot be dealt with, with uh, thinking that produced modernity, post-modernity, post-post-modernity, meta-modernity, and that we uh, need to look for different, a different kind of thinking or different candidates as we um, identify them as system of cybernetics, as sort of the backbone of 21st century thinking, which we may want to label Anthropocene thinking, endorsed by the United Nations, the OECD, uh, the World Economic Forum. They say, Eve complexity in this VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, um, complex and ambiguous. If complexity is the challenge, system thinking is a solution. Ta-da! And to go, but to go further and to say, okay, we have systems and cybernetics as one candidate for the new thinking. We have integral theory as another candidate for new thinking. Very popular, scientifically rather shallow, uh, but if it's so popular, there must be something to it. Let's explore that. And third, um, theories of resonance, looking at um, qualifying relationships in a, in a different manner and looking for um, sound or like my Indian friends would say looking for harmony so okay let's call it harmony um, but to to embark on different criteria apart from what made made modernity which which was truth we need, we need to revolve a bit I mean as soon as we talk about change we're all already in the middle of the field first of all we didn't ask the world do you want to change so so we just uh, impose that. We want to change because, and we always need that because, and we need to answer that question positively, not saying, oh, we, we, we are going to change because everything is uh, broken. Yes, but where do we change to? You can organize for things to come together, or you can integrate by purpose. Uh, lately, there has been a lot of talk about purposeful economy, purposeful organizations, uh, integrating behavior of the parts by a purpose. And that is something we shouldn't underestimate. We can organize, and with, the, with organization sneaks in the metaphor of the linear system of the machine. You organize and you social behavior, uh, a company, and you create the idea that it is all like cockwheels and, and, and works together in, on a sch schedule and it sort of invites you to, to treat it as a machine, which is not. But there's a temptation and, and we see, we've seen a lot of that. So organization is what you make out of it, but it is something that creates power, that creates um, emergence, that creates things which we individually couldn't produce, couldn't achieve. Purpose, on the other hand, is something that's integrating worldviews, interests, desires, coming together. And that is something that seemed to be neglected for a longer while to answer the question, what is it that we collectively want? What is that? Well, we don't, don't want to go as far as what, what's the meaning of life? 
That's close to it. So why, the, why do we organize in a specific fashion? Why do we pursue profit? Why do we, why do, we do things in that fashion and not in that fashion? Why do we all go in cars to, to a workplace and, um, and slave away uh, those hours to return to, to the family? Why, why, why do we do that? This is, organization is more about the how. Purpose is more about the why. And talking about that, um, I'm again cutting a corner here. Ah, back comes the light. As soon as you hit complexity, uh, truth goes, goes out of the window. So, so there's no right and wrong in complexity. Complexity is complex, and there are different states uh, <clears throat> which are all kind of true at the same moment. So truth doesn't qualify for anything. It's just uh, there are possibilities, and none of this is more true than, than the other. And we need to embark on a thinking that is able to navigate that kind of realm of possibilities, of complexity, of um, interlinked dynamics. Scott's Laws of Observation. Bernard Scott, he's a cybernetician, British. Um, and he did a lot of stuff, but well, his, his this one uh, paper where he came up with it, with his Laws of Observation, which are pretty trivial if you, if you, if you hear them, but so insightful if you follow them up. He said, <clears throat> to every observation, or appropriation to the world, to every observation, there's always more detail. So you can dig deeper and bring more details. And he said, second, to every observation, there's always a bigger picture. And third, to any given observation, there's an alternative perspective. And that's why I chased you through the room at the beginning of the day to change your perspective, to be in another, to be in another seat and experience how, how does that change my, my perception of what, what's happening? It may, may not, but to, to understand that you own the worldview. And unless you're not changing your observation of the world, your, the way you, you're approaching the world by choosing a different methodology, by choosing a different theory, by choosing different instrument, by <clears throat> going elsewhere, um, nothing will change. As long as you s recite in your own seat and worldview, nothing will change, only the outer world will change, and you make yourself, I want to say victim, but a passive, part in that self-organizing that happens around you. But you could be, as well, an active part. And by changing your observation, by changing the perspective, you come, to, you come to experience and realize different things. You come to draw different maps. And you come to experience new possibilities, new options for solutions to what you cherish as your problem, if you have one, if it's not, if it's not disappearing because you just changed your perspective. What we see out there at the moment is sort of the distinction between uh, muddling through from crisis to crisis, and next comes the idea, let's change, do in the form of a project. So we, we see a lot of projects out there um, trying to improve or change or save the world. Yes, but that is tedious work. Mm, uh, how, may, how, many, how many projects do we think we can pile up to gain that kind of effect that we need to see to uh, have a thrivable planet on the long run? And what systems and cybernetics is one of the theories I, I talked about um, provides is the idea of systemic change. 
And there's a systemic change first order and a systemic change second order. The systemic change first order would look at a complex system like acupuncture is looking at an organism. Well, you probably know all these traditional Chinese medicine charts with, with the meridians and, and the acupuncture points where you pierce in the needle and it's a minimal intervention, but it helps the entire system to rebalance again. That, there we have a lot of knowledge about the organism, but the same applies to any kind of complex system, to teams, organizations, societies, economic order, political order. They all have their sensible spots. And it's probably something you know from, from chaos theory, from complexity theory, this butterfly effect. Small intervention over there, causing a tornado here. Um, looking out for leverage points where to, uh, the sweet spots of the system. And last but not least, systemic change second order is what I want to label a mind shift. And you relate to that best in terms of a picture puzzle. You all know these sort of dog or rabbit, old woman, young woman. You look at the picture and you see either image. Look at the, the, the duck rabbit and you see the dog. And all of a sudden, you see a rabbit. No line on the paper changed, but your perception changed entirely. What that may have triggered is somebody who said, when you were seeing the rabbit, saying from the side, duck, don't you see the duck? And then you look again and say, oh, yes, now I see it. And we are back to the importance of stories and narratives. A different narrative can change our perception of the world, creating a different world where we see different problems, different solutions, and discover new possibilities for action and provoking change. The invitation to look for the rabbit changed the narrative of what you perceive. So that's why narratives and stories are so important. They change your perception. And that is the source and the, the layer that yields a, a mind shift. It's not all those projects. It's the way we look at the projects. To go into deep sociology, meaning is defined as the unity of the distinction between actuality and possibility. Psyche systems and social system can process meaning in that form. They can relate to what is and to what could be. And that makes all the difference. This is why we can embark on purpose. That is why we can organize, because we can conceive different worlds. We can conceive and, and, and see different opportunities, different realities. We have, of course, our, the mat our matrix of worldviews, language, metaphors, stories, narratives, moods. Yes, we do. And that is sort of pre-configurating what we can see in the world. But we can change it. It's all, it's all human-made. We can change it. And this is why I so much believe in dialogue and meaningful conversations to explore what could be and decide that this is what we want, a different world. What we are seeing now is that if we manage to put an end to modernity and the idea that things are only legitimate if they are true and embarking on um, conversations around functional adequacy, maturity, and resonance, 
we have different criteria. By changing the criteria, we can create new regimes. We all have a, have a sense for what is, and we all have a sense for what could be. But the sense of what could be is limited is limited by how we approach the world. If we think only in technical terms about the world, we miss politics and culture, and also our solutions that we see as being possible will be technical solutions. There will, won't be political solutions, there won't be cultural solutions, or an orchestration of the three. So whenever it comes to changing organizations or, or practices, this here, the, re the red, which is still green, so the red, the realm of possibilities, possible practices, is the decisive moment. The richer my, the richer my capabilities to approach the world through different worldviews, different models, different theories, the richer my realms of my realm of possibilities. I love to distinguish um, the one side as trying to get things done. So getting things done is one mindset. The other mindset is letting things grow. So you, you have the two sides. And of course, there are times when you need to get things done. But w what, what we are not so good at, because we, we, we lost all the, the resonance that we had out of agriculture when the, the major part of the population was still working in agriculture. We had another resonance with the living world. We had a sense of letting things grow. Only because it's complex doesn't mean we cannot do it. Yes, we can find ways to navigate that, as long as we are humble enough to, to recognize that there is a difference between getting things done and letting things grow, and that we are not entirely in control of the output. Although I'm confused myself uh, by the end of the class, I hope um, your confusion, you're still confused, but on, an, on another level. And if that was completed, uh, uh, achieved, um, I would be happy. Thank you very much.